What's up, family? Today, I kind of want to pick up on this conversation that we started a few weeks ago around the evolution of my theology. And in that conversation, I actually went through, kind of walked you through how I evolved theologically over the years. And in this one, I'm actually going to go back and pick up on, uh, or in the rest of these, I'm going to go back and pick up on some particular moments or specific moments in time and kind of give you a little bit more insight into me and, and my background. All right. So before I jump into today's conversation, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, um, consider joining our community, consider volunteering for our community, check out our website, check out our merch. And of course, comment and share and all that great stuff. Um, and of course, all of our links are in the description. So check those out. Um, this conversation, I want to tell you about that time I got kicked out of church for being homeless, right? This should be a good one. Okay. And, and, and this story actually will not go the way that some of you are thinking that it may go. Um, but I did realize that, uh, um, I realized by the time I was in high school that, a lot of things that people had gotten away with in, in, in their mistreatment of me had a lot to do with the fact that I didn't have parents who were active in my life. Um, and of course, the fact that I was homeless. So it was easy to mistreat the homeless kid. But anyway, so this story kind of starts in 10th grade and I'm going to I have a few of my notes here. I just want to make sure I got my mouse on the right screen. Um, but this story starts in 10th grade. Um, and I, by this time I'd been in ministry for about three years. Um, my mother was still struggling with a drug addiction, but for some reason I had, uh, recently moved back from Maryland. Um, I was originally living in Maryland with my father. Um, when his wife didn't like me, he bought an apartment for me. And so I lived by myself in the ninth grade and then my family in Alabama found out about it. And so they sent my aunt and uncle to pick me up who I had never met before. And so I lived with them for a few months. And then finally it was like, well, this kid needs to be somewhere. So they sent me back to my drug addicted mother. This family has great decision-making skills, right? All right. So, um, and, and again, that, that this just shows you, um, and this is something I didn't realize until I was adult. Nobody in my family was interested in the stability of my future. And that's one thing I, I couldn't even reconcile until I was an adult. And you'll see some of that in this story. Um, but anyway, not sure why I kept being sent back to live with my mother. But um, moved back to where I live now, actually, which is Dothan, Alabama. And um, I started back going to high school. And so I was at, um, a I don't need to say in a school name, but it's Northview High School. Um, and I became the co-president of the campus ministry there, which was uh, first priority, I believe. Um, the school I had left um, in D.C., um, one of them, the first one was Frederick Douglass High School. Um, I was on the Council for Christians in Action there. Um, and then I went to Gwynn Park High School, where I became the founder, um, co-founder of a campus ministry called Fire, Fervent and Passion, Righteous and Effective, based off of James chapter five. I think it was verse 16. Um, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much, you know. And so I was a real gung-ho type of guy. So when I realized I was moving back to Dothan, I got right back involved with, with campus ministry and eventually became the, um, well, within the next year, became the president of the first priority uh, campus ministry. I was also a part of the uh, of a local church, which the name of that church was Axe Church Christian Center, for those of you who are watching from Dothan, um, which I was immensely faithful to. I, I, um, I was going every Sunday, every Wednesday, um, every Friday night for prayer, and then every Thursday for um, praise and worship rehearsal. I um, had begged my mom several times to visit the church with me um, because I was super excited about the things that God was doing in my life. And of course, for those of you who followed my uh, my deconstruction story, you know that one of the very reasons I got saved was because I wanted my mother to get saved. I wanted my mother to be delivered from the de from the demons and that she'd become a better person. And so my mother did get delivered from the demons and she even got delivered from the drugs, but she still didn't become a better person. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, so uh, eventually my, uh, my mother, when I would ask her to come to church, sometimes she would lie and say, yeah, I'm gonna come and then not come to which I would be heartbroken. And other times she just forcefully resist. Uh, eventually she got absolutely annoyed by my assistant insistence that she should come to church with me. And she decided to move out while I was at school. So in 10th grade, I came home and my mother had packed her bags and moved out of 
the apartment that we were living in. Um, that, that, that was an interesting time, and it, it was a shoddy apartment anyway, but obviously I was immediately homeless. That's kind of how that goes. Um, and But this was a predicament that she had left me in many times before, which is why you kind of hear me talking about this in such a nonchalant manner. Homelessness has been a major narrative uh, in, in my life. And so I spent the next few weeks uh, living on the streets, uh, but navigating between friends' uh, porches and couches while still attending school and church faithfully. I was still the president of the campus ministry, um, and I was still very active uh, at the church. As a matter of fact, at this time, I was the uh, one of the assistant, or I was the assistant minister of music of the church. And, and I say it that way because there were some interesting things that had happened. Uh, the original min uh, minister of music of the church was Marcus Tankard, um, who was known as Marcus Whiters back then. Um, but Marcus Wy uh, Tankard, he, he, his, he, his family had a reality show on Oxygen, I believe, at one time called Blood is Thicker Than Water. Um, he, he, his, uh, he's from Dothan. His mother's from Dothan. Actually, his mother was friends with my mother. Um, I won't tell his family's business, but anyway... Um, he was the person that invited me to the church. He was the original minister of music of, uh, for the church. Um, and I, I actually looked up to him for, for a very long time. I don't look up to him now, um, and, but that stopped years ago um, because I realized the dude was out of his mind. But uh, like he used to literally drink olive oil. And I was like, what? And, you know, that may, maybe that's not weird outside of other things. But when you're drinking olive oil to get anointed, that's a little weird. But anyway. Um, there's some other things there, too. If you've heard me tell the story about the guy who pretends that the church is filled with the glory cloud and is so thick that he can't see past the third row, it was that guy. But anyway, the first years, um, uh, he's the one that actually invited me to that church in ninth grade. Um, and I was enthralled by the church because coming from uh, Maryland, the church I was active in in Maryland, which um, I, I mentioned it in the first episode of this one. Um, was Victory Christian Ministries International Church. It was more charismatic, more non-denominational. And so the biggest thing that I loved about non-denominational churches at that time in history is that there were more people my age who were interested in and passionate about the things of God. And so one of the things I was really sad about, about having to move back to Dothan, is that I knew that that didn't exist here because we, at that time, we didn't really have solid non-denominational charismatic churches and even as we did develop them that part never really kicked off in Dothan now it was there in Ozark but that's a whole another story but um so um what what excited me about his church is that he was near my age he was actually two years older than me but he was near my age and watch this this shows you how shallow I was and he was a tongue talker so yes you speak in tongues you know the Holy Ghost you believe in miracles you believe in prophecy we're going to have good church, you know, um, and he introduced me to some of the uh, assemblies of God churches that were in our areas that I didn't know anything about. And of course, they're not they're not quite non-denominational, but many of them, many non-denominational churches, many non-denominational church leaders come from the assemblies of God uh, denomination, along with some other denominations as well. But that's why there's so many similarities. Uh, charis charismata and in, in non-denominationalism is kind of an extension of Pentecost Pentecostalism, which Assemblies of God is a part of. So, um, so I was super excited about that. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay, this is before. So, and then in, he ends up leaving the church. Um, he ends up moving in with his father, a world-renowned musician, Ben Tankard, who lived in Tennessee at the time. So he left the church and, and he kind of, he believed that I was going to be the person who kind of took up the charge after him, took up the mantle. And, and for whatever reason, the pastor was like, nah, not him. So they went and literally hired a guy that did not fit the church at all. And when I say this, I'm not trying to be racist, but I, I just want you to understand. The church was 100 percent black and the pastor couldn't find anybody else to fill the position. He didn't want me to fill the position, did not have any reasons why, but just did not want me to fulfill the position. And so he went out and hired a white guy from a Southern Baptist church. He went out and hired a Southern Baptist minister of music for a non-denominational charismatic church that lasted for six weeks. Mind you, I became great friends with that white guy. Can't remember his name today, so I don't know how great of friends we were. But mind you, this was in 2001. So um, this is a long time ago. 
but he and I actually became great friends. He introduced me to great music. He's actually one of the first people who taught me how to read music. Uh, prior to that, I had been playing by ear, which I still primarily play by ear. Um, as a matter of fact, the first song I learned how to play reading music was a song he introduced me to, which was called Above All by Michael W. Smith. I can almost remember all the lyrics to it. I'm almost sure I can still play it by ear, of course. But he, I, the guy was great. Like, he was excellent. Um, but after six weeks, he was just like, this is not a good fit for me. You know, um, I can, you know, because praise and worship was becoming more normalized in, in, in the U.S. and in black churches in particular, uh, and, it, well, in all churches, it was because of that Hillsong movement uh, and the uh, Lakewood movement combined. So you got people like Darlene Sheck and Israel Houghton, Houghton at the time that are making music. So it did kind of make it easier him for him to survive for like six weeks. But then after that, it was like, this is very uncomfortable for me. This is a cultural clash. I don't know why I was picked. And so he resigned. And when he resigned, he he gave me his church key and endorsed me for the position as the person who did before him. The pastor still, for whatever reason, didn't think I should be the person for the position, but did not object to me getting a key and did not object to me actually doing the work of the position. So over the next few um, weeks, I did all the work of the position without any of the acknowledgement or any of the credit. And at the time, I didn't care. I was just glad to be able to use my gift um, in the service of the kingdom of God. Right. So, yeah, I, I had to I'm trying to give you all the context. So now we're back in 2001, 10 uh, and I'm in 10th grade, 2001. I'm in 10th grade um, at this time. My mother has left moved out. I've been living on the streets between friends, couches and porches and in whatever else I can find. Now, typically what I'm doing, I'm still going to school. I'm still serving church faithfully. I have a few friends who will let me go by their house and and and, and shower and stuff. And, and I have a bag of clothes that I'm keeping with me, um, which of course get real redundant, which is actually one of the reasons to this day, I'm not a brand person and I don't buy a lot of clothes. Um, that you know, I don't want to say it taught me, but I learned a lot from life experiences. And one of the things that I learned is that clothes just aren't that important to me. So I'm not the type of person who feels like I have to have a different shirt for every day of the a month. I'm not that type of person at all. I kind of feel like that's a little pedantic and shallow. But anyway, um, you know, so those things formed me. So after school, on days that we didn't have church, I would just hang out with my friends um, and walk the streets at night, literally trying to tell them the, about the goodness of God while I was homeless. You know, so I'm telling them about the goodness of God and trying to get them to come to church with me and letting them know that God is doing amazing things and he is able to do powerful things and he can change their lives. This God who could not keep my mother from abandoning me, abandoning me at in 10th grade, um, which again, wasn't the first time she had done it. The, the thing that had led me to God in the first place was that I had this horrible mother, uh, not just this horrible mother, but that I had horrible parents. I had a horrible family. And I, and I thought that if I served God, God would save them. And it turns out, no, they, they were exactly who they chose to be. And there was no imaginary friend that I could, you know, attach myself to that could change who they chose to be. Anyway, so um, on nights that I, that I did, uh, have church instead of getting off the school bus, you know, near my friends, I get off the school bus near the church, walk to the church and I'd spend hours praying and, and worshiping before the Lord before service started. And then I'd clean up the church. If there was anything, uh, you know, on the carpet of stuff, I'd pick up stuff to make sure that the sanctuary was welcoming by the time people started coming in. Um, and, and the more I prayed, the more I felt like I should be praying more. So I increased how often I would go to church, go to the church throughout the week. So I start going literally Monday through Friday. I just say, you know what, instead of hanging out with my friends, I'm going to go straight to the church and I go to the church, pray and worship for hours and then leave the church and walk the streets until I could find a friend who would let me stay at their house. Um, for whatever reason, the pastor found out that I was homeless and that I was hanging out at the church after school and decided to take my key. He decided to take the keys of the church from me because he didn't want me, this homeless kid, coming to the church, hanging out after school. All right. Whew. 
Um, one of the leaders of the church found out what the pastor did and, and about the fact that I was homeless and was the only person of that church to invite me to live with them. The pastor who found out that I was homeless took my keys and did not offer me a place to stay. All right. Uh, my aunt and uncle who literally, I, I had an aunt and uncle who literally joined the church after the pastor did this, who knew that the pastor did this. They don't understand to this day why I don't consider them great people. Um, I continued to serve that church faithfully until my grandmother found out that I was living with strangers and that she could get extra government assistance for allowing me to live with her. Mind you, I'd been homeless several times in my life and my grandmother had never um, reached out to try to get me to live with her. But now that I was old enough to take care of myself and she could benefit from it, seemed like a good idea. Yeah. All right. Um, I, um, so I had to move in with my grandmother who lived about 30 minutes away. Um, I tried to continue serving in that church faithfully, but the church van could, couldn't afford to continue to pick me up from Ozark 30 minutes away. Um, and my aunt and uncle who joined the church after the pastor stripped me of my key, knowing that I was homeless and did nothing to offer me a place to stay. Um, they also were too busy, um, to give me a ride to this church. Um, so I could no longer go to the church. So I had to leave the church, which I did in writing. I sent them a letter and let them know how heartbroken I was that I couldn't come anymore, that anybody couldn't pick me up. But uh, I move on rather quickly. There was a church in Ozark that I got involved with. And, and I actually rather enjoyed my time at that church for the most part. Um, that church was pretty damn awesome in its treatment of me. Um, I can't say the same for its treatment of others. I have some stories. Um, two years later, as a senior in high school, I found that the church that I had to leave was still looking for a minister of music um, since I had left. Um, and, and I remember a position that they wouldn't give me, um, but I had been fulfilling for almost six months before leaving. It was a paid position. And I thought I thought how awesome it would be. I could return to this church and, and do that position. Um, and I had my own transportation now. So I did decide to apply. I drove 30 minutes to meet with the pastor, only for him to tell me that he could only consider me for the position if I would publicly apologize to his church, to his congregation, for leaving that church when I was homeless and 15 years old and had no transportation to the church. That was in 2001. For anyone who dares attempt to question my sincerity, I stayed faithful in Christian ministry for 13 years after this glaringly bullshit of a situation. Silly me, right? Thank you for hanging out with me. Until next time, keep rising.